Get ready for Season 3 of the Tron Grand Hackathon 2022 with a total of $1.2 million in prizes across Web3, DeFi, GameFi, NFTs, and the newly added Academy and Ecosystem tracks. The wait is over. Tron Grand Hackathon presented by TronDAO. To learn more, visit trondow.org. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and not necessarily those of the blocks. Podcast guests may have taken positions in the assets or other matters discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. For full terms, visit theblockcrypto.com slash terms dash service. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, editor-at-large at The Block. And today, joining us on the other side of the mic here today are my guests, Herman and Rob. They're over at Improbable, the co-founder and chief product officer there. Gentlemen, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Maybe before we dive into a lot of what's going on in the metaverse and digital land and beyond, what are you guys working on? What's the sort of um, the gist of the project? So Improbable it does basically three things. One is that we make technology which allows you to build richer virtual worlds. So mm. you've seen any of the recent public events like the other side first trip with thousands of people in it or our demo a week or two ago with 20,000 people in the same spot. Our main priority is enabling very rich, very high fidelity worlds where you can have, instead of thousands of updates a second, which is what a game like Fortnite can do, where you can have billions of updates a second. And that means you can support you know, really dense, rich worlds where everyone can speak with their own voices, where you can interact together with AI and with physics. So the core focus of the company is enabling and improving this technology. The second thing that we do is we work directly with big brands and companies to build metaverse projects with them, mm. which instead of you know just standing alone and being kind of their own version of a sandbox or a Decentraland, are actually linked together. And that's the third thing that we do. We are the operator of the M squared network, which we've talked about a bit earlier this year, but you know, been a bit coy about. But it's essentially like a confederation of each of these projects into an interoperable, highly technically integrated network of metaverses. And it's gonna have at some stage its own token as well. Got it. So before we turn on the mics, you were talking about how, at least this is what I think you were getting at, the value of land in the metaverse. Do you see the metaverse in the future? Well, maybe we can do some level setting here for a second, right? The way it works today, at least for a lot of these projects, is you get a plot, you sort of build on it, whether it's a house or whatever, you have skins, you roam around, you maybe go to digital concerts or whatever have you. That's kind of what it looks like today. Do you see the future of it looking similar, different, and in what way? I mean, Rob, maybe you want to jump yeah, in. Yeah, I think I had the, the privilege or horrors of, of growing up as a teenager in the virtual world second life. I and mean, that was, you know, a lot of the concepts like land being played out, you know, a decade prior to where we are right now. And some of the most exciting things that happened in that space were when lots of people decided to gather together in one spot. But the difficulty was only 50 people could ever show up in one area of the world at any one time. So when it really boomed in popularity and celebrities started to show up, uh, you know, the servers would start to stop people from being able to enter into that region. And it really reduced the capability for really, really exciting events to take place. I'd go even further. I'd say there's a incredibly essential relationship between concurrency the capability of the metaverse that you're in and the value of the land that you're talking about. You know, it's inconceivable to me that there could be value to virtual land that is supposedly scarce and able to be the basis of a business, but which can only support a tiny handful of people on the plot of land at any one time. It would be like owning an instance of a single Call of Duty lobby. You know, like, I don't know why I would want to own that or why that would be valuable because I don't see how one could build a business on top of it. The other challenge really is that 
usually, you know, a city becomes a booming metropolis like London or New York. And then the land becomes valuable afterwards because, you know, there are lots of people there. Yeah. If you're dealing with a project yeah. or a game or a world which has, you know, a tiny fraction of an averagely successful video games population, it's really difficult to see how the land can have value. Um, you know, Second Life had at its peak almost a million, I think it still has actually, not at its peak, I think now it still has like a, almost a million people like using it. The land in Second Life is not as valuable as the land in projects like Decentraland. And that doesn't really make any sense to me. Decentraland's peak in current users is like almost less than a thousand people on a daily basis. So there's something very, it's very low going on. I mean, it's really, really low. You can see it online. I mean, it's, there's something really, really strange going on with the price of digital land because it-, it I mean, it's just speculation, isn't it? It, it is, but there's also genuine value in the concept of land when it's well executed. So this is the strange thing, right? You know, there's nothing wrong in principle with the idea of land and second life, which was valuable. Or, you know, we're biased, obviously, working on other side and building first trip. But, you know, the land associated with BAYC has all kinds of other benefits. I can see why you could create a land model, right, if you're a brand or a company. But I think that the market doesn't right now know how to price land on the basis of utility. And that lack of a formula for oh, okay. pricing is a really fundamental problem, right? I'm not saying that the value of all digital land is zero. I'm saying the value of some digital land is clearly zero. So I asked people this back when we were in the thick of the hype cycle of digital land, and I was exploring different metaverses. I even bought some land, I think, in Sandbox. I don't remember. It feels like centuries ago at this point. And... When I was speaking with some of these speculators, the way they described valuing it was similar to valuing a web page. If it has a lot of traffic, if there's a lot of visitors, it's more valuable. There's also an aesthetic element too, which you can't really, similar to NFTs, put a price tag on, right? Because beauty or aesthetics are in the eye of the beholder. But you can see that even the fine art market, even were you to tokenize or create an ocean of new beautiful art, that mm -hmm. would be a self-limiting market, right? If everyone owns a masterpiece that can't work, there's only so much consumer appetite to purchase and hold artwork, right? We know this. Uh, yeah, I'd say as well, that it's uh, the analogy of websites could hold up, but imagine if the total amount of people who could ever be on your website at the same time was 50. Yeah, it would be pretty rough to like to do that. And more generally, right, I think we have a gap, a big gap. And I think as optimists, you know, me and Rob, we're building the metaverse. We, you know, we've done a ton of stuff that, you know, over 10 years that shows our obsession with how important we think this value is. But I think there's a lot of FUD and confusion, which will result in wasted capital, wasted effort, and worse, potentially bag holding um, on the part of ordinary people when we confuse the ideas around where the value of the metaverse comes from. Like there are these reports coming out, you see like McKinsey and others of like, oh, it's, a, it's worth a trillion dollars in like five years time or six years time. Yeah. No, no one can explain to me where that growth is going to come from because the video game industry has grown seven to eight percent every year for 30 years. It's contracting kind of this year, I think, post COVID as a result of like the boom and bust of that um, from stay at home. But, you know, at that growth rate, you're not going to get to a trillion dollars in, in the time period that people are proposing. So there has to be this assumed additional economic activity. I think what we're always forgetting is it doesn't matter if we're talking about the price of land, the price of an avatar skin, the price of any digital asset. If there's no underlying usage, if there's no underlying people actually doing something because it's fun and fulfilling, none of that can hold value. You know, it, it just can't because nothing drives that value in the end. I hate to be the, the doom and gloom guy on, on. No, no. So maybe we should define what the metaverse is when we see these, you know, McKinsey reports talking about it being worth trillions and trillions of dollars. What are they talking about? Because that could include a lot of different things. That can include our website yeah, could yeah, live in the metaverse yeah. or well, a game, got, et cetera. You've got some hilarious examples of things people have called metaverses. I mean, I think you should. I think it's, it's literally anything that's 3D. Yeah. I, I think the, the one way I've tried to describe it is a bunch of people have realized that people don't play video games to win or lose. They play video games and, you know, not even playing, they hang out, they use them as social spaces rather than teenagers going to the park, they hang out in Minecraft. It's a word to try and rationalize that there's a difference between a game and a virtual space that people inhabit. So is Minecraft metaverse? I, I would say- Go for, go for it, Herman. <laughs> I would say, look, this is something I'm pretty obsessed with this topic and with um, Rob helped me a lot with this, with the book Virtual Society on, on how, on chapter on just defining this. But I think you can start to derive logically 
what the metaverse isn't and what it is, or it has to be to be an internally consistent and viable idea. So it's got to involve, you know, if we're talking about it from a completely rational perspective, it's got to involve experiences in which value is exchanged from one world to another. If it's a network of worlds or a metaverse or a collection of things, then its value really depends upon the relationship between these worlds. So if you take Call of Duty and World of Warcraft and you try to mash them together, that isn't going to make any sense, right? There's no real meaning to taking a machine gun from Call of Duty into World of Warcraft or vice versa. Even if you could technically do that, what would be the point of that from a consumer perspective? Minecraft, in a sense, is a metaverse because you can build different worlds. Those worlds can have a relationship with each other. Those you know, worlds can involve the transfer of value from world to world, and people can have a variety of experiences inside Minecraft that are differentiated from the experiences that you know, they can have in other games. So in a sense, yeah, it's a proto-metaverse, I think. Got it. But there's the proto well, there. Yeah, because there are limitations, right? The big limitations mm -hmm. are that you know, Minecraft is part of the video games industry, and it isn't something that allows for a massive transfer of value relative to its population size, which is absolutely enormous, you know, in and out of the real world. I think an important element in the metaverse being a new opportunity and an opportunity that can justifiably involve massive investment by real companies is that it has to create value in a new way. So it can't just be making money from people, um, you know, getting fulfilled in the way they do in video games and then paying money for that experience. It has to involve the creation of these digital asset economies, these fulfillment economies that requires a strong mm. way for money to go in and out of the world, which is why I think you don't really get a metaverse without crypto or at least without quite. That's what I was just going to ask. Does blockchain need to be involved? Rob, I mean, what's really I'd say no, but it's really, really useful. I think like the, you've got blockchain can be thought of as two things. One is it's a, it's a specific set of beliefs about how economies uh, ought to be ran and decentralized. But these days, it's essentially the lingua franca of online economies. If I was to build an MMO game tomorrow, I would probably use a blockchain because it has out of the box all the tools I need around marketplaces, account balances, auditability, all that sorts of stuff. So I think it's a fantastic piece of infrastructure that's going to help this stuff come to fruition. Yeah. It could happen without it, but it's a really, really powerful tool. I'd be more aggressive than Rob on that. Like, I think I agree with everything you said, but I'd say, I think in practical terms, I don't see how you get a metaverse without it because of the second problem beyond the tooling and infrastructure side, which you're talking about, which I agree with, which is how can two companies building two separate games both create viable businesses that could themselves be worth investing in and if they end up having to be dependent on a third company's database of users and, and infrastructure. So like we could each make Minecraft mods, but we're only going to make so much money with our Minecraft mods. We're never going to make as much money as making Minecraft, right? Or making a really successful game. So without blockchain as a way of agreeing among companies how to share value and who gets to own the user and how we will manage the economy and the rules of that economy between our games, both of our games either become dependent on one of them or become kind of unviable propositions. So like, I think in practice, the blockchain is the most important innovation to enable an actual metaversal economy. It's far more important than VR. And you could have pretty incredible metaverses that are society defining without VR headsets ever working. That's one aspect of this topic or area that I've noticed on Twitter, Henry Blodgett, the founder of Business Insider, he's sort of has poked fun at the metaverse for this element of VR. Mm -hmm. Historically, he's talked about how nobody wants to wear, or at least a very small portion of the world would want to wear a stupid headset all day long. And I think that's right. But what he's missing is that that's not the totality of what the metaverse is. Yeah, I think one way of thinking about it is, is when we think of, say, TV as a medium in the world, like, it's like thinking about TV manufacturers as being the important thing to think about. Yeah. And we should be thinking about, like, oh, OLED TVs and all that's going to be great. It's like, no, we really should be thinking about the genres and the experiences being had and the stories being told. That's what's important. You know, people think more about Netflix than they do about the next OLED TV coming out. And I think VR is just that. It's just a higher fidelity device to engage. Yeah. And I think you also, you know, to be fair to the people who are criticizing the metaverse because of that, they're right to do so. Yeah, I agree. I think that criticism is on point. Not too many people, except for maybe Davis, are keen to walk around with a... What is the Oculus? It's the Oculus, Oculus device. Yeah, the Quest or... Oh, yeah. 
index. Yeah. But I mean, look, the reason we are having a discussion about the metaverse that happens to involve VR is because Facebook needs the metaverse to be about VR. Why is that? Because they've poured so much capital into it already? If you look at what they've got, like really what they've got, they've got their incredible investment in VR headsets. They've got a game made in Unity, which is basically a clone of Roblox, but you know, with some stuff in it. And they've got their other adjacent services, which are, you know, world spanning Instagram, Facebook, etc. If there's no strong overlap between the business model of the metaverse and advertising, which I don't think most people in crypto would say that that's going to be the main way money is made in the metaverse. And if the experiences that are going to create the most value in the near term don't necessarily involve VR headsets, that's a pretty bad position to be in if what you've done is just made a video game in Unity on VR. You know, it, it doesn't tally with their investment philosophy. Stop. And for that reason, it's so I, brutal. I mean, to be blunt, like it's like if the metaverse isn't about VR or if you can, you know, if, if the majority of the growth and the value isn't, I mean, even the things we've just talked about, like token, tokenization, land, digital assets, digital communities, the fact that those companies who are making investments in content have to own a big chunk of what they're investing in, have to have real fair um, transaction fees and beyond. None of that seems to be part of Facebook strategy. So it's, it's really hard to see how they win or even what it is exactly they're trying to accomplish. You know, that's the challenge. It's, it's just incoherent. Do you think they could sort of live side by side with a more open crypto metaverse? And maybe you have two options. I mean, Rob, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's technically possible. I think it's uh, the way we kind of saw out in the end, right, is the internet could have sort of is what it is. There are some underlying open standards that dictate it all. And then there's a few vulcanized sort of super websites that take a lot of the share. But then there is a kind of foundational distributed infrastructure, which everyone builds on top of. I think the bigger issue is, does it matter that your Facebook information is connected to your metaverse identity? Like, when I am, you know, slaying dragons in this other reality, does the fact that, you know, I, I'm connected to pictures of my like college life, that a good thing? You know, like I think there's this assumption that your metaverse identity will in some way be based on your real world identity. Okay. Yeah, it's the, the, the relevance of the real world social graph yeah. to digital identities and experiences. That's really interesting. It doesn't, you know, I don't really care if I went to college with you, Tordek the Barbarian, like we've just met inside this cave and we're fighting this necromancer. Like that doesn't feel like a decent adjacency. You know, I think, mm. I think it's more likely that companies who are really good at making games content, you know, in the $200 billion games industry, they seem to have more relevant skills perhaps to attacking this problem. But even then, right, they have a lot of disincentives to, to building the metaverse. So what do you think Facebook's thesis is then? If you're kind of outlining how there aren't real synergies between a social media company and a metaverse company in the same way that there is between a metaverse company and a gaming company, yeah. but what do you think their thesis is? What do you think they see that bridges those two vectors? I think they look at the iPhone and they think maybe it'll be like that. You know, maybe we'll build like this amazing premium piece of hardware and that amazing premium piece of hardware will become such an important aspect of the value chain that we'll be able to command all of the software and the stores and the monetization options and everything. And there'll be rainbows and, and it'll be wonderful. And I think it's just, I it's see. just a fantasy. Like, it can't, you know, that's yeah. going to work. I mean, I think I don't take which is it, it's sort of telling by looking at the experiences that are coming out from Facebook right now, where it's you sort of precipitated into some caricatured version of yourself based on your Facebook profile. And they're optimizing towards sitting in a room with five people being as lifelike as possible. It's, it's all trying to be taking like your real life social graph and create like a better, you know, a digital version of real life to try and map rather than trying to create these super, these experiences, which you couldn't have anywhere else. Why are you trying to compete with reality? Reality is pretty good at it. You know, the opportunity yeah. is trying to do things which you couldn't do in reality. And it kind of puts it in that uncanny valley where yeah. it's trying so hard to be reality that it's almost dystopian and a bit creepy. It's also hard to see that even if they do the work to build, a great analogy is game engines. So game engine companies don't actually make all that much money from their game engines. Like publicly, you can see from Unity that the majority of their revenue is coming from advertising. That's really what Unity is. It's an ad company. From Epic's perspective, you know, they make the majority of their money from things like the store and from Fortnite. They don't make that much money from the engine relative to those other areas of business because of the nature of the business model. But the engine is the most important piece of technology at the company, similarly at Unity. 
So one of the challenges we have is that there's this mistake we always make with new industries, where we assume that just because something is going to be an important part of that industry, it's going to be able to command a lot of the value. And Rob, your analogy on TV is a spot on, right? If VR headsets are more like mobile phones, maybe there's something to this. But if VR headsets are more like TVs, then they're never ever going to be some like ultra profitable segment of the market. They're going to be commoditized. There's going to be loads and loads of copycats, you know, all of which do relatively the same thing. So it'll be more like TVs than it would be like the iPhone. Yeah, I guess. And it sort of makes sense, right? Because the iPhone has so many features. It has so many components and pieces which are specific to the user experience, right? It's interface. Mm -hmm. But once you put on that VR headset, you could be in any VR headset. You wouldn't know which headset you're in. And one would assume that the level of fidelity, visual fidelity, is going to improve at an industry-wide standard. And particularly when you have huge players like Apple and Microsoft, you know, entering that market as well. It's hard to see how that product, you know, in order for that product to work, there has to be like a really tightly controlled software stack. And the more tightly controlled that software stack is, the less it's going to work with a crypto metabus. Exactly. So yeah, I wouldn't want to be in that position myself. So does there have to be one underpinning metaverse on which folks build? I, I don't know. I don't think so. I think we could probably think of it as, as layers. And then, you know, as you get higher up the stack, there's more and more in common between experiences. But I think there's going to be like different virtual experiences you have, which are almost incomparably different. And the question of what is shared between them might be like, you have the same profile. But if I have like, I'm playing prop hunt, where I'm running around as a filing cabinet and being chased, and then I'm in some high fidelity socialization space, the question of what the you need of those two things is, is quite difficult to think. Yeah, I mean, I'd say one of the surprising things we're having, we've had like a crazy year where everything has grown much quicker than we anticipated with a lot more people wanting to build you know, large projects and metaverses over the next two years than I think we could ever have predicted in January. And Rob, you know, we both say like we never thought that would happen. What's surprising though is that none of those companies are generally from the games industry. They're all from industries mm -hmm. in like, and I'm just going to throw out random categories here, but you know, sport, fashion, film, you know, music, where they want to be interoperable with each other. We don't have to force them to agree to interoperability. They actually want that because it makes sense for like a sports match or, you know, fashion to have interoperability. It's difficult to really do that in the games industry when you're kind of stealing someone's customer when you make something interoperable. So I suspect we'll get clusters of worlds and those clusters will be based upon how related the content really is. And you could imagine some stuff being completely cross-world, like just the stuff that's on the blockchain in general, right? Like ownership and uh, certain digital currencies and assets. My dogs were barking. Wow, no worries. I, th I thought you were, you were just very disappointed in our answer. I know, right? They are so naughty. Oh, my girlfriend's home. I didn't think she was coming back today. Let me close my door. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we can't hear any of that. I mean, I hope yeah, yeah, it sounds great. Hopefully it's her and not some, you know, robber or something. If you get murdered on a podcast, that'll be pretty, pretty wild. Yeah, it definitely changes the vibe. That'd be one of the most interesting. <laughs> the guy that kills me out and just carries me getting an axe murdered. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just like good content. Yeah. You guys, I would hope you'd continue on without me <laughs> with my bludgeon body. <laughs> It's like, I, do we stop recording now or do we persevere? It's what he would have it's wanted. What have wanted. It's what he would have wanted. He would have wanted us to finish <laughs> the show. Get ready for season three of the Tron Grand Hackathon 2022. There are a total of $1.2 million in prizes up for grabs in Web3, DeFi, GameFi, NFTs, and the newly added Academy and Ecosystem tracks. So what are you waiting for? Join Tron for an opportunity to showcase your work, win funding for your project, and network with other builders in the community. Tron Grand Hackathon, presented by TronDAO. To learn more, visit trondao.org. So here's a good question. It seems like, let's say you have a lot of people in a given metaverse and there's actually the foot traffic in a, let's say, Decentraland. It makes sense that you would have these sort of fashion brands or entertainment brands advertising within these worlds because just like how they advertise in the physical world, if you're going to be in a metaverse or spend much of your time in a metaverse, then 
you want to market to those people. I guess, but we should really stop and think about the value chain here and how different it is and what the market size is going to be. Because the reason people are there is because they want to have fulfilling experiences. This is pretty much well understood science now, right? You have to fulfill someone either through competence, autonomy, or relatedness. Either I have to be having an experience where I'm getting better at something, or I'm making meaningful choices in a consequential world, or I'm being fulfilled. And I'm going to compare that activity to any other opportunity available to me. So that means I could otherwise play World of Warcraft or Call of Duty or GTA, or I could go outside or I could do whatever. So we're talking about a world or a space here that has to have uniquely fulfilling experiences. Because if there's no fulfillment, there's no engagement. And anything that gets in the way of fulfillment or engagement is going to become a real problem for monetization because it's going to churn users away or get them to do something else. So if you now suddenly start sticking ads in my face, unless it's done in an incredibly you know, immersive way, right, in a way that really ties the brands into the world. I think Second Life did a little bit of this. Uh, and Rob, maybe you can speak to that in a sec. But like, you know, unless it's done in that way, it actually detracts from the experience. Also, the per user monetization potential of the metaverse, when people are buying clothes, they're buying digital assets, they're buying power-ups, they're buying land, they're buying all kinds of stuff. That is just going to overwhelmingly be off. Got like it. So ads don't point. make sense to you because it doesn't... They make yeah, sense. I think ads could be so much more. Like the idea of an ad as a billboard is sort of such a... It's trying to like take the real world's constraints and apply it into a virtual space. An ad could be teleporting you to a completely different experience which you run around or instead of having a 2D advert for a t-shirt, there's actually a mannequin you can walk up to and try it on. There's already ideas of that and things like VR chat. People are actually willing to pay for these experiences, which we know they are because look at the video games industry. Then, you know, the video games industry makes $200 billion a year, right? So the idea of, of generating revenue primarily through ads, I think that's a second stage or third stage aspect of the metaverse. I don't think it's the first place where value gets created. I think your underpinning point speaks to, speaks to what Rob just said, which is you can't just take yeah. what works in the physical world and try to apply it to the digital world and think it'll entice people or I mean, we talked about this in, in other stuff there's a fancy word called skuomorphism which is this design principle of taking real world things and putting them into a digital representation to help people and the original iphone kind of like played by that as well like the buttons look like physical buttons a lot right now when people are thinking of the metaverse mm. they're sort of copy pasting their own intuitions of the real world and applying it to the digital assuming it's going to be the same and I think that's the, issue, the thing with land we saw is like real real estate companies were interested in virtual land because it had the same noun. But then the nature of those two things is really quite different. Yeah, there's definitely going to be value in it. But you have to answer questions like, what can I do with the land? How many people can be on it? What experiences can I create? What commercial rights do I have to create those experiences? How will my land enable higher or lower fidelity experiences. And so, you know, for us, as we build out M squared and work on other side and enable thousands of people and build all these tooling components and work with enterprises on the content they want to make, it's really weird that there's no sense in the market of how different that is from, you know, a completely pixelated space that is essentially like, you know, not useful for any near term capability. A lot of projects are promising capability based on the digital assets that they're selling that rely upon some future technology invention. That's really scary to me. I worry that like if there's a big crash in the value of some of these assets, the good and the bad projects will get washed out together. And that's really, really quite frustrating. Yeah, the nature of crypto though. Kobe kind of poked fun at the metaverse broadly, but this specific issue that we're we're dissecting here, which is just companies trying to take what exists in the physical world and jam it into the metaverse, commenting on a partnership between the Sandbox and Renault Korea. This partnership effectively is Renault offering digital automotive experiences in the metaverse, whatever that means, assuming getting to drive around in a car. And Kobe was like, one, he goes, I'm literally, I feel like I'm in some Truman Show style joke where everyone is pretending A, the metaverse is real or a real thing. And B, people there want to drive Renault cars <laughs> instead of flying on a dragon or something. I, look, I'm, But he's right. Why would you want to well, just yeah. just drive in real life? Or you teleport, <laughs> right? It's like, so even a lot of our yeah. perceptions of the real world are being projected, but they're not real constraints. To be fair, though, you know, you play Grand Theft Auto, which is an incredibly successful game with, you know, billions. Fair of enough. Value. Fair you enough. absolutely want to drive, you know, your car. The question is always about... That is such a good point. Yeah. That's such a good you point. Know, the question is about context. I mean, I think, you know, is the metaverse a real thing? Look, I've argued this in 
you know, in various forms, book and otherwise, but it's existed before technology. The idea that there are other worlds which have meaning in them and where we can transfer value back and forth. Look at sport, right? Sport's real, right? The stuff that happens there is real. It's completely made up, but it's super real. It absolutely matters who kicks that ball into that net, even though it makes absolutely no difference. And that leads to real sneaker sales and real desire and real demand for real things uh, you know, within the world. So the metaverse is a thing, but the right way to create value in the metaverse is probably not going to be a, a you know, copy-paste. And, and you, know, you guys used the example of the early internet a second ago. How many companies like, just like, showed up in 1997 and were like, we do the exact same thing, but .com? You know, like we have a website now, right? Like we still sell industrial scale piping, but .com. And, you know, tried to ride that wave. That's all this is. This is the marketing departments of these companies taking a little bit of yearly budget and saying, maybe we can get down with the kids, right? And it isn't, mm. it isn't an effective way for them to unlock the real opportunities open to them, which are enormous. But there's an interesting question, right? If you were sitting there in the peak of the .com bubble, would you really have the foresight to look at what things are being done on the internet? which were going to be successful mm. long-term and which ones weren't. I guess that's kind of where we are right now. Yeah, and there are some people that are starting with experiences that are looking to build incredible differentiated things. Like what we talk with sports leagues that want to bring their international fan base, you know, millions of fans into dense spaces together, have them all cheer together, interact together, have an experience that those fans couldn't otherwise have because they couldn't come to the game and watching it isn't the same as being in a crowd, being, being around people. I think you have to start with experience. If you start with how can I make money from land or what asset am I selling and then try to make up an experience afterwards based on that, it just feels like a really backwards way of creating value for the consumer. We talked about this on the show with Kyle Samani at Multicoin when discussing NFTs specifically, not necessarily the metaverse, but I think this logic applies or this comment applies when you think about the early days of media, the New York Times, for instance, their first website in 1990-whatever was just a static image of what the physical newspaper yeah. looks like. That's where we are now in the metaverse, maybe where we're just sort of just the physical newspaper, but digital. Yeah, I think we can definitely conclude some constraints though, right? We know that some things must be true of any valuable metaverse strategy. It's got to involve new experiences that are not currently extant in video games, because if it does, then they're going to be competed with incredibly successful video games, which is not something I would want to do. Number two, it's got to involve experiences that add value to each other. Because if it doesn't do that, then it's not a metaverse, right? It's not a network of experiences. And number three, it's got to involve a revenue model that's new. Because if it doesn't involve a new revenue model, how is it going to create or grow a new market? So if you just apply that test to a lot of these experiences, you start to go, none of these things make sense. You know, like some things do, but, you know, I think all three of those conditions have to be true to, to be worth a dollar of investment when it comes to a metaverse experience. Got it. So how did you guys become involved with Yuga Labs and Bored Apes? Oh, what a story. Rob is grinning and smiling here because of the fun way. Very, very serendipitous. Yeah, very serendipitous. Mm. Well, um, we were talking to a lot of different companies, but we got in touch with Guy Oseri, who is on the board of Yuga. And he saw our stuff and he just insisted that we engage. And then we began talking with Nicole and the founders, Gordon and Gaga. And we just, we really discovered a perfect fit you know, a perfect fit on both, not only on the way we could support other side, but also their belief in the idea of building a network with M squared of a, a network of metaverses. You know, the fact that they were willing to work with us on making that happen has mean that, meant that other side has such a big role to play in the formation of, you know, what we hope could be the seed of a different way, a, a different approach of creating metaverse content. But yeah, it was all like really serendipitous. Got it. And so what's the plan for that? We definitely can't talk about that just because it's um, Super very secretive. much, yeah. Well, it's more that it's Yuga Labs project and the way we work as Improbable is, you know, we're building other side with Yuga and it's part of M squared, but we like to let our customers and partners speak to their own projects because it's their stuff. What do you think broadly then is the key to success for building as a brand like a Bored Apes? And do you think that every... NFT project or collection will ultimately have their own metaverse. What do you think, Rob? I mean, I, I've been hogging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think one thing which we've really been learning well is I really hope it, we change to a time where projects are judged by their actual shipped deliverable outcomes rather than being judged on tech demos and roadmaps because we've played that game for a decade before. Yeah. We know how easy it is to show something that looks good or you've 
you bought a bunch of stuff off the Unreal Marketplace and smashed together a 30 seconds. You've just seen so many like, people from DOS going, hey, can you help us? And it's like, all it is is yeah, like, yeah. I'm hoping that yeah, it was it this year into next year is a year of actually starting to judge people not on the speculation, but on their actual committed roadmap and what's being started to be shown. So that's probably one point for sure. I, I think the most amazing thing about what they've done is what you need to succeed. They ship something, right? Like, you know, we actually threw thousands of people into an event where everyone could speak and interact and do those things. And that should be an absolute prerequisite for going anywhere near a project. And doing it authentically as well, right? I think they're a good example. It's like a SpaceX like rocket launch. When yeah. the rocket explodes, no one's there like being, oh, SpaceX sucks. Everyone's sort of tied into the journey, but at least they're being authentic and at least they're kind of being honest about where they are. You've got to develop stuff in the open. I also think they focused on new experiences, which is obviously, again, we're biased here because we enable those new experiences. But, you know, it was great to see First Trip have thousands of people hanging out and socializing because all of those people were like, I can't do this in Call of Duty. I can't do this in World of Warcraft. This is new. This is different. Is there a massive market for those experiences? Time will tell. Like we think so, but it has to be different. It's like mobile gaming, you know, for the earliest period of mobile gaming, um, you know, well into the Supercell era, games were very different from the games you could get on PC and console. You know, just porting over a PC or console game has almost never worked, right, on mobile. I think metaverse experiences are like that. You've got mm. to develop new stuff. Yeah, that's a fair point. How do you think the metaverse will bring more people into crypto, right? Well, you need the idea of digital assets that move from experience to experience if you want to make a lot of metaverse business models viable. Mm. So with Yuga Labs and with our other partners, they'll be able to move avatars from world to world and bring things from world to world. And why that's cool, not just for the user, but for the company is suppose hypothetically that your business is putting on a football match, right? And you want to sell people cool items in that football match. And you put on the match and you bring in like thousands of people and millions of people watch and loads of people buy items and then the match ends. What do they do with those items? Where do they take them? What do they do with them? If they can only use them in the brief instance in which you have that event or in which your content is active, the items become, you know, really lack value. So it's in everyone's interest to start selling people interoperable objects, which are even richer than NFTs. One of the things that we're, we're, we're working to enable. Once that happens, all those people are actually using crypto without realizing they're using crypto, right? Mm. You know, I don't, I don't think that the next billion crypto users will realize they're using crypto, right? It's a bit like open source software. We use it every day, but most people don't know that their iPhone is full of it, right? So it'll feel to a lot of people like just playing a game or interacting with regular financial services. But behind the scenes, yeah, it'll be using digital assets to enable the transfer of value from world to world. Yeah, I think that really needs reinforcing. I think when people think about how do we onboard the next billion people into crypto, that is not how do we onboard yeah, exactly. million people onto MetaMask wallets. It's going to be something where they'll be using it without realizing, just like there's so much infrastructure that underlies your lives, which you use without realizing as well. It's the only answer. It's why also people should get less obsessed with which blockchain something is on. Like it's, that is a problem that is that is entirely like in the back end of the experience. Your so who's, fixing, who's fixing that though? Who's making it so that you don't need to download a MetaMask wallet or understand how a wallet works. Well, that's is that your job. Is it a custodian's job? Is it? It's one of the things that we're working, not just with us by ourselves, but with partners on as part of the M squared network. So you could just buy something in a world like you would buy something in a shop with a credit card on online or in a game. Exactly the online services that we've built for like 60 different We've built lots of different online services for different companies and publishers online. So we're kind of creating a web 2.5 system. If you want to bring your MetaMask in and you know have total custody, that's something you can do. But if you want to just let the world handle it for you, that's also something you can do. And I think that's vitally important in the way this stuff works. Yeah, it's like giving them the option. Yeah, because for a lot of brands and companies as well, they don't want to. The people, the really interesting thing about the MetaMask now are the people getting in now. These are the huge companies that are thinking about worlds and experiences that are not targeted at a crypto audience, they're targeted at an everyone audience. And they want to use digital assets as part of that, but they don't want the, the friction of digital assets to be something that the ordinary user thinks about. And this is exactly what happened in the early days of the internet. Remember, like we were all going to run our own web servers and everyone was going to have their own blog. And, you know, that never came to pass, right? We centralized stuff. But the fact that you can make your own blog is important. It's very That's important. one of the principles, yeah. yeah but very it's important. about the fact that there are like these utilities. You're online. not gonna. I mean, you can take all your money out of your bank account in cash and run around with it in a sack. But, you know, that may not be the best idea. Interesting. We got to figure out how we can record a podcast in one of your metaverses. We, we you, might be we, better we, than we could have done that. Yeah. We literally could have done that. When we do our company town halls, we have like a thousand people in the world. And there's a giant screen and we have our Zoom playing on the giant screen and people can also talk to each other. So uh, we would love to do something like that at some point. Let's talk. Yeah, about that'd that. be fun. 
We've been thinking about that for a while. We were going to buy land in one of the metaverses and build a don't, studio. Don't do that. Don't do don't that. Do that? Don't Too do that. expensive? Unless it's on the side. Don't do that. No, I'm we're looking. Uh, we're looking at the price and it's crazy how much they've fallen since, let's see, the peak was like January-ish 2021. As interest rates go up and as the economy corrects in the way that it is correcting now, which is absolutely seismic, even as a layperson just observing from outside, like, you know, we could see a world of very high interest rates where, it, you know, prices around the board for lots of things, not just crypto assets, but stocks in private companies are just not going to look like they've looked for the last 10 years. And we forget we grew up in this period, like as startup founders of the age of infinite money. And, you know, low interest rates and like, you know, <laughs> there were like AI companies and self-driving car companies raising like a billion dollars with absolutely no revenue or customers. And that world is just not the world we live in anymore right now. It's all about profitability. Ah, uh, dropping some macro wisdom. It's, I, I wonder it's if it's wisdom. I hope it's not wisdom at this stage. It's pretty much, a, I'm it's pretty much pretty in a much. burning building saying, look, it's on fire. So, <laughs> yeah. I wonder if one day I'll open the Wall Street Journal and the, you know, top story will be. U.S. metaverse home sales fall for the 10th straight month in a row or something. I think you will see that, but you won't see the word U.S. in front of it. Like, I think the metaverse, metaverse property will probably feel really weirdly into, <laughs> in, you know, it, almost like the start of a network state, you know, to quote uh, Balaji. Yeah, he's interesting. He's great. Well, guys, it's been a lot of fun. I feel like I haven't had a metaverse conversation in quite a while because... There's just been so much going on in the actual market, just a deluge of news. So I appreciate you kind of bringing our audience some useful context for folks who may be keen to learn more. Maybe tell us a little bit about your book and what the core thesis behind it is. So my book, Virtual Society, involves a lot of ideas I've stolen from Rob and not formally credited, but um, and, and from a few <laughs> other people are improbable. But really, it's essentially about a framework of how to think about the metaverse in a consistent and useful way. Starting with the idea that the metaverse isn't just about technology, it's about you know the cultural notion of other realities that we've had for a long time. Then trying to define the metaverse in a way that can be useful for how you might invest in projects or think about creating value inside them. And then really looking at the bigger social implications of having a metaverse. And in some ways, it's a little bit of a rebellious take versus some of the folks talking about the metaverse as just like the next internet or, you know, the future of video games. I've tried to look at it more as the future of, of culture and society. Got it. Interesting. We'll have to check it out. And where can our listeners learn more about the firm? You can, of course, come to our website and our Twitters. Uh, following me and Rob, you'll see all the little clips of new technology. Oh, Herman's leaks of the week. Yeah, leaking the 20,000 CCU thing was fun. I got into a bit of trouble internally for that. But it'll be fun to sort of um, you follow us there. I think a lot of the information is much more on Twitter now than anywhere else. Of course, Twitter is the place to be. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining the show today. Thanks for stopping by and chatting with us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for being on the show. The Scoop will be back for you again with another great guest or guests. Have an awesome day. Looking for more great insights from The Block? Check out The Block Research, the premier platform for research content on crypto markets and the digital asset industry. The Block Research membership includes cutting-edge reports, webinars, company maps, and more, available via our dedicated research portal. Visit theblockresearch.com to find out how to join today or contact a member of our sales team at sales at and let them know that Frank sent you.